Hello everyone, and welcome back to some more Jisenjo no Mao. We are neck deep into the climax of the game. Uh, maybe not neck deep, but we're, we're really deep into the storyline now at the very least. Uh, we're on Usami's route, heading towards, you know, the real end of the game, the true ending. So, with all the intensity of the last episode, let's get right into this one. Usami Haru, alone, rushed to his Aigonzo's mansion. After being rejected by the man she loved, she held no more hope. She decided to take the opportunity to drown herself in her chase for Mao, her mother's killer. <coughs> Azai Gonzo stared at his sudden visitor. He was prepared to be killed by Haru was prepared to be killed by Gonzo for allowing Yuki, a comrade of Mao, to escape. She knew there was no way to live in the city with Azai Gonzo as an enemy. Take one step outside the safe zone. Uh, Yuki and Mizai had hold themselves in, and Gonzo's men would be waiting. As if they knew their prey would give in eventually, the Yakuza continued their surveillance of the Tokita household. She spoke without reverence, and stared challengingly into Gonzo's eyes. Flattery wouldn't work on a, this beast of a man, anyway. Defending herself in even the slightest would prevent him from taking her seriously. She was prepared to bear her vitals, her stomach, her jugular, any number of vulnerable, vulnerable spots to show that she wasn't afraid of the beast. Gonzo's interest seemed to be somewhere else. Haru doubted her ears. Kyosuke ストレスの積み重ねだ。そして、ストレスがあっても外に出せず、感情を押し殺すようなタイプに起こりうるという。A lump rose in Haru's throat. She could tell Kyosuke had a brutal past. She could also tell that he didn't have a single friend who understood the man behind the cheerful mask he wore at school. She muttered, as if speaking to herself. Haru may outwardly say she suspe suspects Kyosuke, but inside, she trusts him to an almost idiotic extent. However, she didn't have any proof to present to Gonzo. She had no way of convincing him that Kyosuke was not the one who had taken the Miwa family ransom and blown up his car. The beast's eye shot open. Haru suddenly felt that the intimidation oozing from Gonzo's every pore had stopped flowing altogether. Gonzo repeated. Haru, helpless, could do nothing but wait for Gonzo's inevitable judgment of Kyosuke. Haru couldn't tell if he was speaking about Kyosuke or himself. A voice called from the next room. Gonzo answered, and a man in a black suit appeared, carrying a cordless phone. He left again without saying a word. Gonzo took the phone, then kept silent for a bit. Haru had no idea who the caller was, or what the call was about. Gonzo finally spoke up in a threatening voice. No 
that seemed to be the end of the conversation. Immediately after that, Gonzo stood up. He seemed to almost forget about Haru's existence. Oh, no. Gonzo hid a gun in his pocket, then walked outside with a haughty gait. The beast was going hunting. There was nothing Haru could do to stop him. Looks like the fish bit my bait. Two Mercedes Benz rushed along the dark harbor. Muscle jumped out of the cars when they stopped. Gonzo has six cars with him. He must be underestimating me. Most likely, they're not carrying anything bigger than pea shooters. Furthermore, I wonder how many of those six have actually killed someone. They may be Yakuza, but there aren't many Yakuza who spend days out in the secluded mountains practicing with loaded firearms and live ammunition. The only problem is, our man, Azai Gonzo, is refusing to come out of the vehicle. One with heavy tinting, I might add. Thus, I can't pa uh, paint Gonzo's vitals with my scope's crosshair. Still, there ought to be plenty of chances. These men, who are used to living in a peaceful country like Japan, would never dream that they're being targeted by a rifle on a rundown building 200 yards away. My sniping isn't something to brag about, but I have an excellent scope helping me. An expert engineer adjusted this, uh, the focus for me, so even if my aim is a little shaky, I shouldn't miss my target. I grip the rifle, and the smell of oil from the gun reaches my nose. I motor monitor the situation through my scope. I was right to have chosen the wharf as my hunting grounds. It's a wide expanse, with practically no cover. A large man, reminiscent of a bodyguard, turns to talk to the back seat of one of the cars. Boss, we can't find him. His throaty voice echoes through the silent night. Azai Gonzo is definitely here. He's being careful, having his subordinates search the area. Now, how to smoke him out of the car. I stick a rod covered with a soft cloth into a barrel of the gun. I finish up the cleaning, then put five rounds of ammunition into the chamber. The bullets are tipped with ceramic, designed to pierce through the most through most bulletproof vests. I take out the hand towel I stashed in the instrument case I transported the rifle in. I intend to use it to quickly gather up the shells after the fact. I wrap the weapon sling around my left arm, then fix my elbow firmly to the ground. Making sure to support my, uh, the gun with my bones and not my strength, I put my cheek and right hand up to the stock. My preparations are about finished. The ocean is quiet, and there isn't much wind. I took the, into consideration the humidity and air currents between the buildings also, but I couldn't find anything that might upset any shots I fire. All that's left is to find Gonzo and aim at him. I took aim at the Mercedes-Benz Gonzo would be coming out of. I then heard the sound of a car engine and checked the situation through the lens again. A taxi had pulled up. It stopped by the side of Gonzo's vehicle for a moment, then quickly drove away. I snicker when I see who had stepped out. I adjust in my sights to take into account the crosswind. Taking into mind the effect of gravity, I move the crosshair slightly upwards. Now, come out, Gonzo. I'll take you down in one blow. But for some reason, I can't keep my cool. It's not excitement for the conclusion of my hunt, and it's certainly not pity for the beast who ruined my mother. Then, as if sensing the disturbance in my heart, Azai Gonzo jumped out of the car at the exact right moment. With the agile movements of a wild animal, he ran with his body low to the ground. He roared. Of all places, he was looking straight at me. As if he knew he was being targeted by a rifle. As if he predicted that I'd use this position to snipe him. Why? It's conceivable that he'd be cautious of a sniper. That's why he didn't come out of the car. But why? Before I could think, a will to put down the beast took over me. As I Gonzo's huge body was dead center in my sights. He arrogantly looked up at me. Now, do it! The beast came to be killed. I aimed the crosshair at his chest. I steadied my breathing. 
Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. I keep my eyes pried open. My eyelids are frozen in place. I take aim. I put my finger to the trigger and squeeze ever so slightly. The rifle fires. The sound of the gunshot echoes throughout the docks and Gonzo's huge body shakes. The bullet went in just below the lung. I missed his heart, but it's a fatal wound. I put a little bit of gunpowder in the bullets. So right now, the beast's insides must be... What? How is he still standing? His knees didn't even falter, and his face is filled with violent excitement. His bloodshot eyes seem capable of leaping from their sockets at any second. It was like the standing death of Binky. Binke? I don't know. My body shrank back at the final roar of a beast on the verge of death. The very next moment, Azai Gonzo's mouth vomited a, ver a veritable bloodstorm. He was smiling. Azai Gonzo spends his final moments bellowing in laughter, spewing from his lungs a sea of blood, and despite seeming to drown in it, he continues laughing. The rifle shakes, pounding against my ear. No, it's my arm shaking. For some reason, I was trapped in a nightmare that the beast 200 yards away was devouring my intestines. Calm down. I killed him. Azai Gonzo is dead. There's no doubt about that. Right. There's nothing to panic about. His last screams were nothing but the howling of a dying dog. Laughter? Humbug. That was nothing more than the convulsions of a hyena who failed to kill his prey. <laughs> no matter how cool I try to play, my violently beating heart betrays my desire to flee. Did he just demonstrate the difference between us as animals? When I looked into the scope again, I was overcome with fear. There's no one there? The wolves, now without an alpha male, had dispersed without without a hint of disturbance. They merely rushed to the nearest cover and redirect, redirected their attention. The only thing in view was Gonzo's body, lying on the ground. This is bad. I missed my chance to take out the rest of my targets. I underestimated them. I thought Japan's Yakuza were a bunch of dunces, more bark than bite. Without uttering a word about their boss's death, they came straight for me. An army that keeps moving even after losing its commander, eh? If they're truly this competent, it's highly probable that one of them noticed the flash from my rifle. In other words, I should assume they know where I am. I quickly pack away the rifle and prepare to withdraw. I dash down the emergency staircase of the rundown building. I'm careful to move as quietly as I can without sacrificing speed. I leave the building in the harbor then hide in the shadows of a warehouse. I manage to escape by a hair's breadth. The men infiltrate the decrepit building I had just been in, in groups of two, covering each other's blind spots. Their cooperation was reminiscent of the Special Forces buddy system. In all the battlefields I've been in, I've never felt so alive. It was a narrow victory. No, in all honesty. I have no idea how I was able to take down Gonzo. Why did he leave the safety of his car and put himself in danger? I can't figure it out. Nevertheless, it seems the devil has smiled upon me today. I tasted my revenge against the beast that drove my mother to the grave. I should be content with this. Farewell, Azai Gonzo. Now, Usami, you're next. When I went to the, return the rifle to its instrument case, I noticed something upsetting. There were footsteps attempting to match mine from the street corner behind me. I'm being followed. Is it the Sonoyama group? They're sure fast to react. To verify that I'm being followed, I keep turning corners until I return to my starting point. Was it my imagination? There was no sign of a tailor. In any case, Sonoyama men wouldn't bother to tail me. They'd just strike the moment they spotted me. 
but they might be keeping an eye on me as they gather reinforcements for a sure victory. I should leave this place. I head straight for the Eastern District. The night isn't over yet. In fact, it's barely past twelve. I had just left elementary school. I was on my way to meet my dad, Samijima Toshikatsu, at his workplace. Naturally, there was no way he had time to play around with me during work. Thus, I figured I'd sneak up to the incredibly high rooftop to satisfy a bit of my childish curiosity. The tower was a skyscraper, a full 50 floors from the street. The view from the roof was perfect. The wide golden sky seemed to envelop me as it wrapped around the earth. It was gently spotted with shadowy clouds. As I was staring at the scenery, the sun set behind the snow tip map. The sun-tipped mountains, or snow-tipped mountains, I can't read. Even as a child, I was moved by the beautiful sky before my eyes, until I noticed her on the other side of the fence. What are you doing? She was sitting at the edge of the roof, her legs dangling over the distant sidewalk. Hey, aren't you scared? She didn't answer. She was reading a thick book. Naturally, the wind was strong up here, and the pages blew around incessantly. Are you reading a book? I thought she was strange, but that just made me even more interested in her. Why are you reading in a dangerous place like that? She spoke sullenly. You aren't scared? If you fall, you're gonna die. Usami? You were certainly still a weird child. She turns the page of her book while talking. You're pretty weird. She talked about difficult, abstract, concept, abstract concepts so fluently. Are you a girl? Her short hair made her look like a boy. Mm -hmm. Nope. Huh? I didn't really get what she was talking about, but I replied anyway. Um, I like girls with long hair. Well, it's not like it matters, right? There's nothing wrong with having short hair. I laugh, and she sulks. I'm waiting on my dad. Huh? How did you know? You're a kid too. Oh wait, does that mean your dad works here too? Let's play. I'm bored. What are you reading? Let me see. I think I remember seeing Crime and Punishment written on the cover. Nah. <laughs> What's your name? Huh? Your name. There was a strange pause. Yusa. What? Yusa. What? Hiro? Tanaka. Tanaka Hiro. What kind of name is that? Well, nothing, but if you're a hero, you're strong, right? Can you use magic? <laughs> Whoa, awesome. Whoa. What kind of magic is that? You're weird. I should be talking, you know, in more of a childish voice. I remembered my first encounter with the young hero and the Sano rooftop clearly. I really must have some sort of mental illness to lock away such an important memory. Now, Usami's next. Before the high from spilling Gonzo's blood had subsided, I made my way to the Eastern District. I decided upon a grave for Usami Yoshinori's da uh, daughter long, long ago. 
Isami should have heard about me from Tokita Yuki. I've told Tokita quite a bit about my activities. I've told her about the underground channel and about my connections to foreign nations. I even let her stay at one of my lairs once. All the information I gave her, I gave her knowing that she may betray me. Thus, I'm not concerned about Tokita's information hindering my plans. But it could make Usami's gambits less predictable. In any case, ensuring that you're guiding your opponent's move is Battle Strategy 101, the very fundamentals of combat. Hmm. I'd say this calls for another game of tag. I wonder if that cell phone I gave Usami has any minutes left on it. I try calling her. She quickly picks up. Yo, Usami. How are you? Usami moans. <laughs> the medium must be having a blast with it by now. The whole city will erupt in pandemonium. The death of the Soniyama Group boss, the most powerful member of the Soa Alliance is a hefty trigger. The scales of power in the underground will be completely upset. The Azai Corporation front will fall also. How is Tokita Yuki doing? Will she be handing herself over to the police? Trespassing? Attempted murder? She has quite the laundry list of crimes by now. If Tokita Yuki is arrested, it would reverberate the Special Investigations Unit of the police. To the, yeah, her father, Tokita Akihiro, is said to be a brilliant man. If I can, I'd rather like to avoid doing battle with him. Usami simply ignored my provocations, though. I want to meet you. Usami's breath halts. You know the park in the Eastern District, near Tsubaki's old house. There's a levee nearby that leads to the to a drainage channel. We can't just walk in nonchalantly. They don't allow visitors in the outer underground discharge channel at this time, you see. Plenty. The structure takes in water from all surrounding prefectures. Didn't your father ever tell you about it? Usami didn't answer. There's a tunnel entrance a little over 200 yards west of the drainage channel. The fence is usually locked, but it'll open as a service to you. And don't worry about the water. The channel's empty at the moment. Inside the tunnel is warmer than outside. What's she acting so cool about? This will be the final battle. Your final battle, that is. I'll choke you to death, just as my father did to yours. Ah, uh, here we go, this track. She called herself hero. She hadn't done so for any uh, reason in particular. She just saw the word hero on the page in front of her. Then she felt like saying it. She didn't have any interest in the boy. She put her hand in her shorts pocket. Inside was a small pocket watch. It was a favorite of hers. After all, it had cu uh, cute little penguins on it. Clutching her pocket watch, she stood up. Hey, wait. A strong wind pushed its way towards her. With tremendous force, it crawled up the building. It slung across her ankle and yanked her foot away from its solid grip. As she lost her balance, she finally, and for the first time, looked at the boy's face. Watch out! The boy reached out his hand. His desperate face neared her. He moaned. He struggled. He writhed. The light from the evening sky twinkled on her pocket watch. I'm going to fall, she thought. She was on the verge of death, yet she was calm. She merely had to pull out the trash bag and get in it before, uh, before hitting the ground. The boy's breath tickled her ear, as if to spite the din of the rushing wind. Her vision was filled with the expanse of glowing orange sky. At some point, she had come to rest in his arms. He hailed her, as if to protect her. She could feel his warmth. She was more embarrassed than scared. I said it was dangerous, didn't I? You stupid idiot! She felt his breath on her again. She finally understood that she'd been saved. She muttered and searched her pockets. Of course, it wasn't there. It fell. You should be happy you didn't fall. 
the boy seemed to be angry. He let go of the girl and pouted. The girl went to the edge of the roof again. She looked down as if trying to find it. Of course, it would have been impossible for her to spot a pocket watch from 50 stories up. Was it important to you? Are you sure? The girl turned to face the boy. She hung her head as she spoke. Don't say such sad, sad things. She didn't mean to say sad things. She just hung her head. Had the evening sun betrayed the feelings within her? Alright, I'll find it for you. Wait right here. The boy turned around. She didn't understand. She had never asked him to find it for her. I said I gave up. But the girl couldn't spit out the words she had gathered up to stop the boy. Darkness fell. She stood there in a daze. It was probably about time for her violin practice. She waited. It got darker, and the artificial lights took the place of the burning red sky on the rooftop. Not a single star was in sight. The wind that had nearly robbed her of her life had brought thick clouds along with it. It was cold. She waited. The roof door was thrown open. Someone shouted happily. A shadow dashed towards her. Another voice shouted, even happier than the first. The girl vaguely realized that the second voice had been hers. The pocket watch was fine. There were a few small chips on it, but the smallest needle kept ticking away, second by second. It was a miracle. Almost like magic, the boy said. The hero's magic. A warm fire burned in her childish mind. To her, the boy was the hero. She stared at the boy. He looked back at her with a gentle expression. She wanted to give him her thanks right away, but the re her rebellious heart wouldn't allow it. She couldn't help but feel embarrassed as he stared at her. Snow. The boy opened his arms wide and looked up at the black sky. He had looked away from her. This was her chance. She could say it now. Her heart had been aching, holding it in. Aren't you cold? Want to wear my coat? His eyes met hers again. His thoughtfulness warmed her heart, but her shyness returned with a vengeance. Her lips suddenly started moving. She couldn't stop them. She realized that she was growing flustered. She was usually more calm and able to speak logically. <laughs> she was always ignored by the other kids her age. Thus, she decided to ignore them too. She had once read the phrase lone wolf in a book. She decided that being a lone wolf was her goal. She apologized, choking back her tears. The emotional little girl in her finally surfaced. Hold it in, hold it in, the girl said to herself. She'll be dragged halfway across the world again. She won't be able to stay with the boy. Stay a lone wolf, stay a lone wolf. She ran away. Her conscience ate at her. She ran off. As she ran off, the boy shouted his name. I'm Kyosuke. We'll see each other again, right, Hiro? The girl didn't answer. Her legs just stopped moving. In a way, though, that was her answer. Kyosuke kun. She said his name over and over in her mind. The snow covering Tomenbesu City had piled high. In stark contrast, the snow covering the girl's heart was primed, prepared to be thawed. She arrived at the meeting place Mao had mentioned, and found a tunnel just under a gently sloped levee. She opened the broken gate, passed through a dim tunnel, and finally reached the underground channel. It was a monstrous, <coughs> excuse me, monstrous wide cavern. Supposedly, the room could hold flood water from the entire metropolitan area in, a ca in the case of a disaster. Haru thought of her father, Usami Yoshinori. 
she smelled cigarettes and heard the sound of mahjong tiles. Most of the memories she had of her father had at least one of those elements. She never had the chance to see another side of him. Her mother, Kaoru, had dragged her across the world with her. So when she heard that he had been killed by a man named Samijima Toshikatsu, it didn't hit her too hard. His co-workers shed more tears at the funeral than she did. She merely thought of her, fa her father was a well-loved man. It wasn't until much later that she realized her father had somewhat deserved his end. Rumor ha uh, had it that he passed his illegal gambling debts onto Samijima Toshikatsu in some nefarious scheme. Haru's mother swept her off to Germany in the meantime. The two fled the public's prying eyes. I can't blame Kyosuke-kun for resenting me. Those were happy memories. She had met Kyosuke on the Sano Corporation rooftop for many an idle conversation, and not once did they ever worry about their feuding families. Kyosuke was cheerful, eloquent, and courageous as a boy. The polar opposite of Haru, who was unable to fit into Japanese schools due, due to her German upbringing. Usami Haru's only friend was her hero, Samijima Kyosuke. Where is Mao? As if to brush away her warm memories, she focused on searching for her mother's murderer's footprints. Reading a book again? I found the girl's pocket watch just yesterday. I went out of the Sano Corporation's roof today as well. I was hoping I might see that hero girl again. Yeah, I came to see you. Let's play. Don't know. Dad is working. Mom's at the hospital. My brother is in another country. Yeah, England. He's really smart. Hmm, about 10 years, but you're the same age as me, right? Of course. Why? Opening act? What's that? I really like Air on the G-String. I heard of it because my dad listens to it a lot. He's always listening to it these days. Oh man, that's so dark, isn't it? Because we know the reason that he's listening to Air on the G-String. But... <sighs> oh yeah, and I like Earl, Earl Konging too. I heard about that one at school. It's kind of dark, but cool. Its title means devil. Hey, you'll come back, right? From New York. What do you mean for now? Are you lonely? Your dad's always busy, right? Mine is too, and I had a baby sister a while ago, but she died. Her name was Kiyomi, and she was really cute. But we're still happy. Sometimes my brother comes home too. I took a picture of him a while ago. I can use a camera. Next time I'll take a picture of you. As a keepsake. Don't worry about it. Come to my house sometime. I didn't say next week. I said sometime. Anytime. We can all have dinner together. I'll tell the, you the address. The entrance to a dark tunnel looms before me. This is it. The outer underground discharge channel. Several footprints had trailed mud through the passage. Wait for me, Usami. I listen in, and hear footsteps echoing from afar. It's Usami. She really came alone? This should be fun. 
I'd have expected her to call the cops. She must be drunk on heroism. She must want to catch me with her own hands. That. Or she must have decided I'd run away with my tail between my legs if she led police into my trap. Either way, she's come to die. What a foolish hero. She stubbornly chased me all this way, despite her powerlessness. She'd have done better to live the quiet life of a violinist. It's time to end this. Over here, Usami! I shout an invitation to her deathbed. As I anxiously awaited my reunion with Hiro, my life took a turn for the worse. The police called the house one night. They informed us that my father, Samijima Toshikatsu, had been arrested for murder. I'll never forget my mother's strength and kindness that bitter night. What's wrong? I asked her. Nothing, she replied, smiling. The next day, I was scared to go to school. I had been a leader in my class until then, but after the incident, I had no place there. Are you alright, Kyosuke-kun? You look like you might collapse. If there's something on your mind, you can always tell me, okay? My teacher reassured me during homeroom. When she did so, my classmates' apprehensive stares twitched. Everyone, be nice to Kyosuke-kun. He and his dad are two different people. He didn't do anything wrong. We should try to support him. That triggered the bullying. The kids started throwing around the term death penalty as a joke. And come to recess, and come recess, I often found a jump rope nodded menacingly to my desk. I came home to my mother slumped in a chair when she would typically be cheerfully cooking. With a broken face, when it had clearly given up, she welcomed me thusly. Did anyone say anything to you at school? I panicked and quickly put both of my hands to my neck to hide the bruising. The doorbell rang incessantly. I opened the door to a swarm of buzzing reporters and cameras. The bright flashes blinded me. Hey, don't take photos of the kid. I'll crop him out later. Hey kid, do you mind? Go get your mom, son. I was overwhelmed by the wall of people. I tried to close the door, but they shot their hands out at me like a pack of zombies. They jammed their feet in the threshold, refusing to allow me to escape. After one of them stubbornly shoved a camera through the gap, I lost consciousness. He lost consciousness from that? Wow. Alright, but anyway. From that day forth, my life was hell. Day after day, hordes, packs, swarms of media stormed my, my once peaceful home. Neighbors shut their mouths off about my family. And every time we nearly lost ourselves in the earthly chaos, a lone shark from the underworld named Azai Gonzal returned to collect his due. My saving grace was what reminded uh, remained of my family, my mother and brother. Samijima Kyohei had rushed back to Japan when he heard the news. He didn't stay for long, though. He merely reprimanded me a few times, supported Mom for a little while, offered a, st a stick of incense for our late sister's portrait, and planned one more brief trip to Britain to drop out of school. However, Hell had other plans for my mother and me. Kyohei was caught in a subway bombing in London and lost his life. And so we find out the fate of the brother. Kyohei's funeral was a sad event on many levels. Apparently, the bomb's blast was so powerful that not even a scrap of his body was found. With Dad's dad unavailable, Mother acted as chief, uh, chief mourner. I think she was at her limits. The deep despair had painted an impossible pallor on her face. The relatives in town for the morning had taken care of the funeral arrange arrangements apparently hoping to help Mom out. But behind the caring facade, they were all conspiring to strip my father's assets from him. Despite being tormented by debt, he always had adamantly refused to sell the house. He saw the house as the last stronghold of his family. And besides, why should we have to sell off the house which held our memories of Kyohei Nisan and Kiyomi to pay off the debt which we sh uh, shouldn't rightfully have? Of course, that logic didn't work on our relatives. One of my uncles had lent father the money to pay off his, uh, his debts. With land that was worth over 275,000 yen per square foot, just ripe for the taking, it was only natural for him to take initiative and put his all into this little event. My brother Kyohei's funeral was neither a celebration of his life nor a, a moment of sorrow, but a farce centered around the sparkling gold. <laughs>
This particular uncle was a self-sustaining fisherman from Hokkaido. My father was the only successful person in, this, in his family. He was raised poor, but studied like a madman to get into top university and land his job with Sano Corporation. His brothers must have been jealous and likely asked him for money often. That, on top of the 100,000 yen uh, dad sent home to his family every month, You'd think my uncles would be a little more loyal after all that money. Even as a child, I could feel the evil intent hiding behind their kind faces. I could hear their whispers from the other side of the shut sliding doors. Toshikatsu is such a damn buffoon. You know, he never was one to talk things over with us. His wife's got it tough too. She's a Toyama family girl, but I hear her folks won't let her come home unless she divorces Ko Toshikatsu. Don't look to me like that's gonna happen. I told him time and time again, these inlander women are scary. Sure, she's got it tough and all, but she's rolling in Toshikatsu's dough. She may be a cute little thing, but she's too old to have any more kids. I'll take care of it, just leave it to me. You mean the money? I'm sure the good lord wouldn't mind if we took a little something from a guy who decided he'd rather cause trouble than support his family. I wonder why I'm in a place like this, as I listen to the priest chanting sutras. Just a few days ago, I had plenty of friends, my family was happy, and the sky from the Sano Corporation rooftop spread far around me. Now my father's in a jail cell. My mother seems about to faint. My brother was so thoroughly eliminated from this world, but there's nothing left of him to mourn. And to add insult to injury, the media and my family circle like vultures, willing to watch us suffer for a buck. Why do I have to go through this hell? Why must I struggle on the spider's web? Why do I have to be afraid of people's stares and whispers? There was someone looking down on me as I hailed my knees in the corner of the room. <laughs> His fake smile was so unlike my father's that I found it hard to believe they were brothers. He was telling us to hand over the house in a roundabout way. I'm staying with mom. Annoyed that he couldn't pick a better time, I stood up against him. Dad didn't do anything wrong. He muttered, and then turned around to his other brothers. They don't usually engage in open confrontation. They just use sly means to get their way. But mom loves dad too. His face grew more threatening. My body shakes in anger as I realize I can't escape him. Alright. I don't want to upset her. I nodded to that. But my uncles heaved a relieved sigh, thinking they'd won me over. I was just thinking of my mother. What could she, uh, could she say in her defense, with the whole family ganging up on her? Would anyone believe her if she alone pleaded her innocence? She did nothing wrong, I thought. This is unfair. I was angry at myself for being powerless and ignorant. If Dad were here, he'd beat them up. If Ko Kyohei were here, he chased them off with eloqu eloquent words. Anyone. I wished for anyone to come save us. If just one person would come to defend my mother's honor, even if it accomplished nothing, I would be satisfied. The sutras end, and I crouch to the floor. If I let myself be seen crying, I've lost. I grit my teeth, desperately trying to bear the pressure. The door at the back slides open. When did she come back from New York? With an unbelievable amount of gumption for that tiny body, the hero had jumped in. 
Everyone was in a clamor at the sudden intruder. My eyes meet with hers. She must have guessed what was happening, seeing me with tears of anguish in my eyes. Hiro stared my uncle down. It sounds like she overheard the conversation. No way, Kiyomi-chan? Don't be stupid, Kiyomi died. But she said her brother. The adults seem to have just realized that this is a funeral. Some kid none of them knows suddenly showed up. They looked at the girl with white faces, as if they'd seen a ghost. Her intelligence and courage stopped my tears. My uncle's face, warped with greed not half a moment ago, was now clearly quailing. It was awesome. Hiro came and saved me from this hellish place. It was only then that Mom shed her first tears. Maybe she really believed Kiyomi had appeared. The tears on her cheeks bore hints of a hue other than sadness. Hero living up to her name, right? But now, back to the, the present. The depressing present, right? After all that... Where is he? She searched for Mao in the monstrous cavern among its countless, countless towering pillars. The silence seemed to hurt Haru's ears. She realized she had walked into the trap of her own volition. There were plenty of hiding places for Mao. He could be aiming at her with a gun at this very moment. Mao's voice suddenly rang out from the abyss. The extreme echoes in the artificial underground space masked the location of the speaker. Hearing her father's name didn't move Haru in the slightest. The ominous darkest around darkness, excuse me, the ominous darkness around her seemed to engulf Haru, and with every passing second, she was more sure this was indeed the residence of the devil. Footsteps echoed around her. She, he was close. Haru pricked up her ears and stared into the darkness, refusing to let a single sound go unheard. It paid off. She heard a noise and turned around. A piece of concrete had fallen to the ground. It was a distraction. Was he toying with her? The tension began to run her breath ragged. I watch you saw me from behind a pillar. My only question is this. Is she armed? Most importantly, is she carrying a gun? She's traveled extensively in her life, so it's possible she has experience with live ammunition. However, where would she get a gun in Japan? And she'd have to be a fear a fearful sharpshooter indeed to hit me in this darkness, but there's always the remote possibility. When she quickly turned at the stone I threw, I watched the twisting of Usami's clothes. I couldn't see any bulge at her waist that might be a sidearm. I'll laugh if she turns out it turns out she hid something in her bust or the like, but I don't intend to give her the time to reach any elaborate hiding spots. Nevertheless, it seems that she does have some sort of weapon. I keep a close eye on her right hand. She's holding it low and tense. In other words, it's poised to move quickly in the event of a surprise attack. Thus, she's carrying something near her right hand. Her skirt pocket, most likely. What kind of weapon is it, I wonder? A small knife, maybe? No. I'd say it's more likely a common women's defensive tool. Pepper spray, or a taser, perhaps. They even sell tasers in the shape of pins here in Japan. Now, allow me to demonstrate my reverence for you, hero. Usabi didn't respond. You didn't bring any friends, let alone police, and chased me all the way alone. Indeed, this is nothing more than a game after all. 
Thus, I won't intrude upon your honor by taking you down with a rifle from afar. You wouldn't use a shotgun to kill a rat, would you? Despite the fact that rats spread some rather troublesome diseases. I thought it'd be best to choke you to death. Just like father. I feel like mimicking him uh, might allow me to carry some of father's karma. I burst into a dash. I leap from the uh, pillar to pillar, keeping my cover. I reach a second pillar, a third, and I keep moving. I can tell Usami's breathing is getting unsteady. I should have expected. She didn't blindly swallow my words. I'm carrying a gun under my suit jacket. If I get careless and she gets the drop on me, I'll just shoot her and be done with it. Haru Vision! Now he's moving to the right. He moves between pillars with the swiftness of a panther. Haru panicked at Mao's playful movements. She never fought with her life on the line before. She certainly didn't expect the karate she practiced after quitting the violin to work on Mao. This was her best chance to defeat Mao. As long as Mao's pride continued to play with a powerless, powerless girl like her, she would eventually be given an opportunity to strike. The chance will only show itself for a moment. She checks for her hidden taser again. Just pressing the 10 centimeter long weapon onto an attacker's body will send electrodes flying into their skin. The manual claimed that it supplies 500,000 volts, enough to rob the consciousness from any human, no matter the size. Haru tries to uh, close in on her target. She moves to the pillar she last saw Mao at and glues her back to it. Sweat slowly trickled from the fingertips of her tense right arm. We continued our dance for a while, switching places now and then. This great, round open space. The pillars standing are uh, at equally spaced points. Usami must be losing her bearings running through this repetitive scenery. As proof of that, I have Usami's back. Of course, Usami will, will be watching her six carefully. We're around five meters apart. All I need to do is jump out and strangle her slender throat. But is it possible? Usami is most likely hiding a weapon. But if she has a weapon, why doesn't she keep it in her hand? Be it a knife or a taser, it would behoove her to hold it ready for a quick counterattack. Is she unarmed? Or is it that she wants me to think? Is that what she wants me to think? We're getting nowhere here, Usami. Not a fraction of a second after I opened my mouth, I heard a sound I hadn't heard until then. <laughs> That metal sound must have been the weapon in Usami's uniform. Did she knock it against a pillar or something? <laughs> I run through the darkness again, taking distance from Usami. What are you waiting for? I'm right here! I wait patiently until my prey weakens. A schoolgirl who hasn't been through basic training will inevitably run out of, run out of stamina. Your breathing is getting heavy. Is something the matter? I weave from pillar to pillar with blinding speed, leading her on with a glimpse of my back each time. Usami chases me. Is your hatred for me this weak? How long did we play this hide and seek? I look back and scrutinize Usami's face as it's lit by the emergency lights. Her eyes are unfocused and her lips are flaccid. There was indeed a black weapon in her right hand, most likely some sort of taser, as I'd predicted. Usami trips, and I don't fail to recognize my chance. She must have got, uh, got caught on a pillar. Usami falls to the ground face first. The black object falls out of her hand. I turn aside uh, deftly and fiercely draw on the fallen Usami. Usami hurries to jump up, and I push her down. Now, die! I put my hands to her already deathly pale neck. What's wrong, hero? Use your head! As I say that, I put all my strength into keeping the blood away from her brain. Dad! 
taste it well. Your father died this way too. Usami slowly stops resisting. I'm taking her life. The sensation is so incredibly intoxicating. My father, Samijima Toshikatsu, wished for Haru's death. As long as she lives, the demon named Usami Yoshinori will never be taught his lesson. I have no mercy. I don't feel any pangs of conscience. Usami will die in my hands. The life quickly fades from her eyes. In contrast, my face must be warped with, the, with delight. If only you could see me now, father. I'm finally going to get... There's something coming from my chest. I look at it reflexively. Shock and regret fly through my mind. I was being conceited. Who said she'd only have one weapon? My teeth crack in humiliation. Oh. Mao's screams pour down like rain. Haru sque squeezes out all her remaining strength. She had pulled out this hidden weapon from her skirt pocket. The taser she was clenching took out uh, took to Mao's chest. Usami Haru gathered all her love for her mother and resentment towards quitting the violin. She forced these emotions into her arm and threw it forward. There was a flash like lightning. Or at least, there was supposed to be. But she couldn't believe her eyes. Electrode should have fired into Mao, then discharged with a vengeance. Is it broken? No. Something in Mao's chest blocked it. Something hard. A lot of civilian tasers come with the warning that they won't work on especially firm surfaces. A gun? By the time she tried to push it onto another part of his body, it was too late. Mao smiled. She feels all the power drain from her. Her last weapon was smacked from her hand and flew far out of reach. His hands wrap around her neck. Despair wells up in her. That was it. She had nothing else. This is the end. And I'm going to leave it on this cliffhanger right here, actually. I know it's really evil of me, but my evil is hollow. What can I say? So, hope you guys enjoyed. I'm really enjoying this myself. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode.